It is Wednesday afternoon. It is January 12th. We are moving along rapidly. Uh, maybe not quite as fast as God did in creation, <laughs> but we're getting there. And just picking up, we were doing just a quick review of the earlier days, but we'll focus right now. For lack of time, we don't want to take too long on our review, but day five, we started with the animal life. We saw that that started with the swarmers swarming in the waters, and we saw that was more than God making a male and a female. He was making a multitude, a number, uh, and it tells us that evolution did not evolve out of the water. These were created in the water. And we saw when we moved from, uh, well, they were, they were, I think, among the first of creation. Yes, they were, definitely. That talk about them being living, that they had a living soul. That means that they had breath within them. It does not mean that, that they're spirit, soul, and body like the human, but that they are soul or should I say spirit? The Hebrew says it's a living soul. Let me just say that because we'll talk more about that soul and spirit as we deal with man. Um, we saw after the swarmer swarming, the fishies in the sea and everything from our little guppies to our big whales and sharks and, and all of that, that then God talked about the birds of the air. And that here also, well, and it was the birds in our air, you know, in our lower air where we're breathing. And we saw that there were different kinds of birds also from the little tiny sparrow to the great big hawk or eagle or whatever. I'm sure you can think of something greater than I can. But in each of these swarmers swarming and in the birds flying, God created them in such a way that they could reproduce, but it's always within their kind. That you never have a bird give birth to a cat. You don't have a cat give birth to a fish in the ocean. Kitties have kitties, birds have birds. It's, it's just always much room within the DNA for the variants, for the species that we see, for, for the little poodle and the great big great dame, for the St. Bernard versus yeah, the Heinz 59. That's a mixture of all kinds. Anyway, you get my idea. We see that God blessed them all. He said that they were good. He told them to be fruitful and multiply. Multiplication is not a result of sin. And we're going to see that's true for mankind also. It was not a result of sin. That these creatures all had that soul of life. They, it implied that they had conscious life. Let me put it that way because that will distinguish them from the plants. The plants are alive also. Plants grow. But they don't have a consciousness of life. Um, we're talking how... Um, I think I've said it. I don't want to just repeat it. But by the way, God's order of what was created and when flies in the face of evolution that wants it in a different order. Evolution wants insects that become amphibians, that become land reptiles, and then they become birds. But this isn't God's order at all. And nothing on earth has ever proven God's order to be wrong. Interesting. <laughs> We're thankful for electricity today. <laughs> May it stay. <laughs> Okay, and again, each reproducing after their own kind, even in the fossil records, you don't find anything halfway. You don't find any of the in-between stages that evolution needs, and we even saw last week that even just the evolution of the eye would be so many stops to have that one little change, that one little change, that one little change to finally make an eye to form that eye in an eye that would work at the same time you're dealing with a complex organ like your kidneys and your heart and liver and all of that just happening to come together at the very same time through that evolutionary process that they all worked in relation to each other. And you have, well, as this um, source that, that I stole it from said, it'd be like taking an old watch, throwing it at the wall, and the outcome being an improved watch. Yeah, not likely. So verse 25 told us now that the sea and the air were filled with living creatures and God is now going to turn his attention to those animals on the land that we talked about last time. So again, just putting it in the major to get our minds back together. We saw that he created beasts referring to the large animals like the elephants and the lions and the wild animals. 
We saw that he made the cattle. That would be um, more of our domesticated animals. I'm going to say our dogs and cats and that sort of thing. We think of cattle as cows, but not necessarily. And I don't know whether you're going to put that. To me, that's a beast. <laughs> but if you want to call it something different, that's fine. And then we see the creeping animals that were created also. This would be some with feet, some without feet. In this category, you have your reptiles, your insects, your worms. But God's covering all the categories. He made the beasts of the earth. He made the cattle. He made the creeping things, as our scripture tells us. And the divine word, good, was given to them. The blessing was not pronounced on the creation, though, until after God creates man. He, it's like he's in such a hurry. He's telling you, I created this, and I created this. And in God's form, I believe that we're going from, um, what would I say, less complicated to the more com com complicated <laughs> development that we could see that. Like, he made this, and then he made this, and then he made this, and his crowning glory is going to be man. And that's where we were when we left off last week. We have that God said, we will make man in our image after our likeness. We threw out the proverbial majestic we because it just that, that's just an argument that just lays there. There is nothing in scripture to say that, that God was calling himself a royal and so royal that he had to refer to himself as more than one. Like a king sitting on the throne that says we, but it's only he just does not fit. We looked at the fact it could not be God speaking to the angels because he's going to say we will make man in our image. So that would mean that the angels would have to be in God's image. They would have to be like God because that would be the only way that would work. If they're lesser than God, then he can't be making them in a lesser image and a greater image at the same time. So as we looked at it from the very onset, we see that scripture is telling us that God is deity. That as we looked at the scriptures and we looked at um, original covenant and we looked at the Brit Shah, the new covenant, talking about the fellowship God and the Son had. That we see that even though in some way that really boggles the finite mind of man, we have a God who is one, the one true and living God, but yet he is personified in three personages or personalities. We see him as father in heaven. We see him as son who came onto this earth. The son was given, not that the son was born. The child was, the flesh was, but the son was given. And we see the spirit move, even as we saw in creation from the very beginning, that God and the son, both in verse 1, created, bara, Elohim, God's created, and we saw the Spirit of God, the Ruch, move in verse 2 over the face of the earth. In that same way, we have that same God who showed us himself in these different ways, now being the one who is speaking to himself, so to speak, but yet he's speaking to his equal partners who unite as one. Remember, again, we cannot fully understand. I'm not telling you that you have to understand it 100% because if you did, then God would be on a human level. So no worries. We take a lot by faith. How many of you got up this morning and started pleading with God that there'd be enough air in the world for you to breathe today? <laughs> and I think no one's going to say they did that. How many of you walked into this classroom today and examined that chair that you were sitting in before you sat down? But you sat down fully expecting it to hold you, and it did hold you. And we know that gravity holds us on this earth. I can't see or understand gravity, but I'm very thankful for it because I'm not falling off. <laughs> I'm able to stand here, and what's even crazier is I'm able to stand here feeling like I'm standing straight up. And if I'm up, somebody else is upside down, and, and there are those hanging out sideways, and yet because God in his creative majesty made it such that we all feel as if we're standing straight up and we are able to do our duties, to be, be ourselves. So much more than we can comprehend and understand, let alone God who never had a beginning. God who will never have an end. We who will in the spirit never have an end. 
I honestly cannot grasp that concept, but we believe it, and we know that God made it very clear. It wasn't Roger, okay? He was by the door and happened to be moving, and all of a sudden, I'm going to get my um, tablet up because I forgot to do it earlier. My apologies, but I want to get it up in case if we lose everything else, I may still have this and uh, be able to go with it. But picking up in Genesis 1 and in verse 26, I believe is where we want to start as soon as my tablet wakes up. Which, of course, since I forgot, decided to be slow today. There we go. Okay. And, sorry, folks. Uh, okay. We, apparently they are having problems because this is also... I may be going to my hard copy, which I always bring with me. No worries. <laughs> I do not trust electronics. Okay. Genesis 1, it is here, and we are... Uh, we're actually picking up in verse 26. We've talked about the, who God's speaking to, that he's speaking to himself, to the other forms of his triunity, because he is a trinity, a three in one. Let us make man in our image. And we talked a lot about this last week, so just recap quickly. In our likeness, or in our image, tells us there's an eternal spirit within man. There's that spirit that's going to continue on living. When we peel out of the shell, we keep right on living in a different way that is our spirit in us. That spirit that it is, um, okay, the aesthetics of that spirit, I'll put it that way, are the ability to appreciate, the ability to reason. We alone have the concept of beauty, um, art, taste, this is part of what makes us who we are, that we are in his likeness. In that, we have moral and spiritual attributes. Um, we have that free will, but we have that moral conscience that something is right or something is wrong. It gives us the ability to think abstractly, like when we're trying to understand God and his creation, with which we don't fully get, but we can understand, again, appreciating the beauty and the emotion of it. We have the capacity for worshiping and loving God in this manner also. And along with all this to boot, what makes us different is he made us also with that free will. Now, last time we saw that God made us in a way that he could inhabit our human body one day. He made us in a way that we are like him, even though he is not confined like the human is. So we have to have eyes to see. God sees, but he doesn't see with a human eye. God hears, God smells, God knows, God touches, God remembers, God speaks. We can do all those things through the faculties God gave us. I guess that's a good enough word. And he did this. He designed man's body. I believe, with what he's telling us from Scripture, he designed man's body with the plan that he was going to enter that body one day. So he made it fully compatible for himself to enter into man's body. That's what we were trying to say last time when we found it difficult to put it into words, but our scriptures clearly told us that he prepared a body for his son. We know that the Ruach HaKosh, the Holy Spirit, came upon Miriam and she was found pregnant. She did not enter into a relationship with a human to have the seed fertilized and a baby begin to form in the womb. It was by the virtue of the Holy Spirit that God had made man's body to accomplish this will of his, this plan that is just. Okay, here's my big adult world word. Wow, <laughs> that's just so amazing how God could think it, plan it, carry it out, and do it blows my mind. But he did, and he conforms us. He makes us uh, he's to be able to inhabit in the way that he did. But remember, we were made in his image. Not he made in our image, but we were made in his image. We're a vessel. We're a vessel, most definitely. Most definitely, yes. We are so separated. 
from the animal creation, and this is what we're stressing now right now, that even though we're made up of the same elements, because animals were made out of the, the earth, and, and not quite in the same way, but we know that what God made them of, they go back to dust, you know, when they die. And we know we're made of the elements of this earth. But the big difference, and here we go, here is where we're, we're into our new thoughts today. The, the big difference is God breathed into man and he became a living being. That's why we can have man, a saw made, and bara created the idea being out of nothing because God created us. He made us our elements, our body, out of the elements of the earth, but then he created that breath that came into us from himself, not from anything else. And so in essence, I think I can safely say it, I think about it and I maybe struggle a little, but I think I can safely say that the soul of man is the breath of God. Because without the breath of God, we're not living. We're not a living soul. Now, why I hesitate when I say that is when I think that there are living souls that will never know their creator God and will not go spend eternity with their God, that's where my, my wording falls short. But in my human confined state, <laughs> this is the best I can get to try to get it across to you. And I trust that I am communicating clearly that you're beginning to see how special you are, how individually created the human is above all the rest of God's creation. That it really is a wow moment when we realize we're not just another animal here. There is something so different in us and uh, that makes us, and that is the breath of our God. He breathed in, and Adam became living. Rowena, yes. Uh-oh, uh-oh. I see your mouth moving. I see no mute, but you're muted. No, she's not moving. Okay, she's not. I'm not hearing a thing, though. Let me check her settings. She's growling. <laughs> and she's not an animal. <laughs> can you hear me now? Yes, we can hear you now. Okay. Could you repeat what the difference when you said about created and formed using the word barah? Oh, okay. When when God tells us that he made man, and I lost my, my genesis here, when he said that he made man in verse, um, okay, God created man, okay, let me get my page out that tells me because I don't want to tell you wrong and I may have forgotten to pull it out. Um, there's one time when he talks about how he made us and that's a saw. And that is, here we go, okay. A saw is in, okay, 27 is bara. So 26 is a saw then. God said, let us make man in our image, okay? Sorry. When he made them a saw, He's fashioning man out of the earth. We're going to read about that in chapter 2. We're going to go more into that we're formed out of the dust of the ground. That's a saw. A-S-A-H is the closest you can do for the Hebrew word, um, a saw. Okay, but when we read that God created him, that word is bara, and bara is, is new, a new shape. It's, it's a miraculous. It's the... Um, where when God created man, he, that's, I believe, when he's talking about putting that breath into man. So his body was a saw, but his soul, what made him become that living being, is bara, is that created um, in a new and astonishing and miraculous way, not just taking the elements of something else and putting it together. Okay? Do I, do I see confused faces? Or are we okay? Okay. Okay. Yes, Julie. So the act of God breathing, just question. The act of God breathing, the I would say bara. breathing into us is bara, and that's what makes us eternal beings. Yes, 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 because it's the breath of God, the very breath of God. God breathed in the man. Man became a living being. When God first formed Adam, he wasn't living. He wasn't moving. He got made of shape, but he, that was it. And then God breathed into him, 
and he became a living soul. The very breath of God went into him. That's why he exists eternally, because the breath of God cannot stop. It doesn't end. It goes on forever. And that's the difference for man above anything else that's living. It's that breath of God that breathed in, and that's where God uses the word bara instead that he created. What verse is it where he... Um, I think we're going to get that in chapter 2. Okay. I'm studying in chapter 2, so I have a hard time separating them. Yeah. But as I glance, I think it's chapter 2, and I want to say around verse 7. Because I'm not seeing it right here. Then that's why. Okay. And if it, let's see if I can lay my hands on it well, quickly or my eyes on it. it. You're correct. It's 2 7. It is 2 7. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Okay, and when I get there, I've got some exciting things to share there, too, so stay tuned. <laughs> I get all excited because I'm always learning something new. So let me bring you something that I think you will like. Do I want to say it right now? Let me tie up this thought, and then I'm going to bring you something else um, about God's communing with human that he made. Um, the rest of the world exists through the word of God. God spoke and the world exists, okay? But man has God's peculiar breath. That makes us a little different there too. The breath is like the seal, the pledge of our relationship, relation to God. That gives us our God-like dignity, our, you know. In other words, animals breathe, but that's all they do. We've got the breath of God. And in that breath of God, our soul comes alive that enables us to know uh, to reason, to, to think abstractly, to appreciate, to have those godlike attributes that we have, um, that sort of thing that is above what the animals have. You know, they, they say, I know what I've seen animals show shame, so I can't carry it to the nth degree, but we're the animal that blushes. We're the ones that, that can reason and think through it, and we know animals reason to some degree, but not to the level that man does. So here is where I'm trying to make the difference that that self-consciousness and that free will um, that leads us to know the spiritual side that leads us into that relationship with God. Okay, um, man alone has that, that personality that, that I've just been describing, the will that sets man apart, the morality to make conscious decisions of right and wrong. Uh, and the spirituality, to have a communion with God. You know, we don't see it in everything else. Now, I know it tells us. We've seen the inanimate. We've seen the stars and the sun praising God and singing for God's glory and so forth. So I can't take it totally away. I can't say that they're devoid. Some sources do. I can't. But I do believe that there's a level of <laughs> spiritual communication between man and God only. That's not with all the rest. Even as the angels are in his presence, but they don't know him in the way we know him. He never became like an angel. He became like a human, and he made that human in his likeness so he could make himself in that human one day. You know, the, the car before the horse and the horse before the cart, and it works, <laughs> okay? So hopefully you're, you're grasping enough to just say, yeah, I get it, I know what she's saying. Even as Yeshua, Jesus is the express image of God, which is closer than a mirror, re you know, reflection, because we know the mirror isn't 100%, but God and Jesus are 100%. Even, even like that, that divine likeness, we had that also, um, not that we were equal to God, don't get me wrong, we are his creation that makes us less, but we had more of that um, awareness prior to sin. That's what we lost in the sin. That was broken for us. Um, that divine essence, that divine likeness was shattered because of sin. It broke in us. I'll bring to you when we get there, and there's argument on both sides, but there is a belief that there was like a glory aura around Adam and around Eve when they were created in the express image of God. And when they sinned, that that glory shining dissipated, disappeared. I shouldn't even say dissipated because that sounds like it went slowly. We see a taste of this when Moshe was in God's presence and just shown, and they had even 
cover it, veil it, but it slowly went away. With Adam and with Eve, I believe they had it and never would have lost it if sin hadn't entered in. But when sin entered in, it shattered that, it broke that. We lost that express image that was there that, that's described as in Hebrews 1, 3, belonging to Yeshua, Jesus. But we will be transformed again into his glory. We're in that process now. We don't see it fully, and we never will. I don't care how sanctified we live. We'll never 100% on this earth be in his image perfect. But when we're out of this earthly, trapped, sinful state, then we'll be able to shine with his glory as God had intended from the beginning. That's amazing. That's our God. So we will get to be transformed into his image again. Is speaking uh, overall. And we would need to realize none of this was an evolutionary process. I don't want you to have any room for evolution anywhere because the Bible doesn't give you any room for it. If there's no room for it, God put it into order and then let evolution take over. No. God did it. He did it all. He did it perfectly and he did it completely. And if we didn't have that, if we didn't have the fact that we're made in his image, without it, everything else is just, um, oh, what's the word I want? It just bounces off. It's random thoughts. It's, how, how am I going to put this? What I'm trying to say is there, when you hear an unsaved person questioning, what's the meaning to life? What am I here for? What's the purpose? What is the purpose of human Apart from this, apart from knowing we were made in God's image and a connection with our God, it is meaningless. It is useless. There isn't anything. We might as well be amoebas, okay? And, you know, live it to the best you can. Eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow you might die. It's over. It's done. If, this, if that's all there is, then yes, it would be survival of the fittest, and it would be go out and enjoy but that's not where it's at. That's not who we are. That's not what we're like. It's not the purpose we were made for. God put into us an innate spirituality to know that, to know there is a reason why I'm here, and there is a God who made me. And to deny that is to put us on the level of, I don't know, why do I pick on the amoebas? But, you know, a nothingness that it's a dog-eat-dog world then. And we can see why the unsaved world does live as it does, because it is. You know, i got to grab everything that I can as I go, and who cares about anything else? This is it. Oh, what a horrible, horrible world it would be if evil got away with itself and good never got rewarded. No, thank you. <laughs> okay. Um... I think, I think this might be a good time. Yeah, before I go into this next thought, let me bring to you, out of the Hebrew, how much God wants to commune with his creation. And in this case, I'm speaking his human creation. I'm not speaking the other animals, and I'm not speaking the inanimate objects. I'm speaking that God went to a lot of trouble to make an ability to communicate with man. Okay? See, remember, we're his crowning glory in his creation. And he wanted something with us. So I'm going to take you back to the very beginning. You'll think you're never going to get out of this, right? <laughs> I'm going to take you back to Bereshit. But this time, we're going to see it a little differently. I think maybe I will spell it going down. Okay, Bereshit. And how did I spell it before to you? I think T-H, I think it's how I put it on. It doesn't matter. We'll get there because we're only going to be looking at the Hebrew consonants. So I'm going to take you to the very first letter that gives us the B sound. And in Hebrew, we call it bet. In English, we call it B. We say A, B. Hebrew says Aleph, bet. So every Hebrew letter has a name. I sound like a song I ought to teach us, <laughs> teaching us the Hebrew alphabet from a nursery school viewpoint, which is where I need to be to learn it. But bait is the word to give us the sound B, okay? Um, just to give you the, the main ones right now, resh is the R sound, and some of this you've heard before. 
The SH is the um, shin sound, which is different than sin, and I don't mean sin as in we sin, but there is an S sound and there's an SH sound. And I went down too far, I think, but the T is top, okay? So, whoops. Zoom can still see it. Zoom can still see it. Okay, if you all need to stand up for a minute to see it or you need me to write it up, let me know. But these are our four Hebrew letters that give us the word Bereshit. Remember, our vowels come in to help us know how to pronounce it. Um, when you have a Hebrew script that gives you markings, if any of you have had phonics and you have a straight line for a long vowel, you have a, a smiley face for a short sounding vowel, if you understand that in English and Hebrew, their dots and their series of where they are in position, almost like a braille, that tells you how to pronounce. But the manuscripts originally came without those. They just added those to help us understand. That's why you'll get so many different spellings for the same word. But let's just look at those main letters now that are giving us the meaning of Bereshit when we're talking about in the very beginning, God wanted to communicate, or commune, I'm sorry, not just communicate, but commune with man. And I say that, not just communicate, not just talk, but commune, actually commune. Y'all know what a commune is, don't you? Where they all live together, and it's all for one, and one for all, and they share everything, and it's all in common. Well, it's kind of like that idea on the perfect scale, okay? So, when we take the first word, the first letter sound, bait, Hebrew, the word bait means house, okay? So, we've got a house right in the very beginning. I like houses. <laughs> the house, well, I'll tell you what, remember the house, we're going to come back to the house. The second letter that gave us the resh, the resh is the way we say it, the R sound. Resh means head. And I mean head not as a head on a body, but the head, the start, the beginning, the initiator, the progenitor, all of that. If you remember when we talked about God creating in the beginning, we talked about some of this. We talked about him creating the house. We talked about him being the head over the house. We're, gonna, we're still there. We're not stealing away from that, but we're seeing this in relation to man now. The third letter, Sheen, we know stands for God. Okay, remember I told you that's like our, and I, I, my son will not forgive me if I try to draw it in Hebrew and it looks horrible. So the closest I'm going to do is my three fingers and a bar at the base is three equal though. And um, one base, one solid telling us this is God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, three in one. That's why I believe he took this letter Shem out of all the Hebrew alphabet, that he could choose 22 letters. He chose this one to stand for himself because it shows us a united God, our Echad. Remember, our God that can be divided but is one. Now, the new word to you that we didn't talk about before is Tav. Tav gives us that T sound, and Tav from the Hebrew stands for truth. Okay? And I'll put this up here also. Because... Just following through, and if you don't get it all the first time, don't worry about it. We could go back over it. But the word truth in Hebrew isn't just Tav. Tav stands for truth, Shin stands for God, Resh stands for head, Beit stands for house. But if we did the word truth in Hebrew, we would do Emet, E-M-E-T. Now those E's sometimes are traded out for A's, but E is a little more accurate. But what you have here, the E sound comes from the Aleph, okay? It comes from the A, the, the beginning, the very first letter. I don't want to confuse you all too much, but this, it, you have to get the whole picture. So the E gives you Aleph, the M gives you Mem, and the T gives you Tav. Now, in English, we say everything from A to Z. That means our whole alphabet, from A to Z. In Hebrew, is everything from Aleph to Tav. And in the middle is mem, okay? So when we say tav is standing for truth, we're saying it encompasses the whole truth. Nothing but the truth, but all of the truth. You've got the whole truth from A to Z, from alpha to omega in the Greek from all of to tav in the Hebrew. You've got the whole truth encapsulated in emet, 
When we say truth, that's what we're thinking. So our picture here is going to be giving us the whole truth, and we're getting a whole complete picture. I'm sorry, what was mem in the middle? It's the middle. So you've got the beginning, the middle, and the end. You know, nothing missing, nothing yeah. left out. You've got it all. Um, what's our middle letter? Might be M in our alphabet too. But they usually just give you the beginning and the end. You know, they usually just say A to Z, alpha to omega, all up to top. But Mem's just thrown in there to show you it's encompassing the whole truth. Okay, now we want to put all this together to get our full meaning. So we go back to bait, which means house. Now, without confusing you, just trust me. Each letter in Hebrew has a numerical value, and it's not one, two, three, four, but it has a numerical value. And the Hebrew value of 18 is chai. Chai is life, okay? Many times you see Jewish people wear a necklace that has the chai symbol for life on it, and they're often given to it when they turn 18, and they oh, wow. use the, the letters to form the chai, which is kind of like that. There's a little more to it. But they use these letters. They'll make a 1, and they'll make an 8, and make, it, make the chai to be a symbol for life. And it's kind of interesting that at 18, we say we're an adult. 13 in, in Hebrew, in, in um, Judaism, but 18. Um, anyway, we get life. Okay, so. How do you spell Say it again. Chai, C H A I. In in our English, C H A I. Chai. Okay, it can be spelled other ways too, but that's what you'll see mostly. Okay, so the house bait has that value of life that we get from that number 18. What we're seeing is God breathed into the house. Remember how we just talked about the breath of God came into man and it became a living being, okay? So, God breathed life into the house so he could abide with man, okay? Because in essence, when God made Adam, he made a house. And then he breathed into the house so that this house came alive and could have an interaction with him. Life. Okay? Are you beginning to catch it? Uh, let me keep going. When you see the hole, sometimes it helps. You can go back and go, okay, click, click, click. Okay? It is interesting to note that the temple... Now, first... <laughs> light bulb went on over here. I love it. <laughs> yes. Boom, boom, boom. Yes. Okay. It's interesting to note that the temple... First, you had the tabernacle. The tabernacle was station was non-stationary. It could move. They could pack it up, move, and they did move it. You read about that through the wilderness. But when they finally had come into the promised land and had settled in the promised land, then they made the temple. Okay? They made it a permanent structure. The temple was in Jerusalem. It was destroyed, but it never was picked up and moved like the tabernacle. Okay? Now, the temple was made... Okay, I don't want to confuse you. It was made for God to, to t still tabernacle with man. All right, the purpose of the tabernacle was for God to dwell in that tabernacle in a way that let the children of Israel know God was dwelling with them. They saw it in the, the pillar cloud. They saw it the Shekinah glory. They saw when the glory covered the mountaintop, you know, it was tangible so they could see, they could know. And God said he did it to dwell with man. So when God, when the temple, the permanent structure was made, it was made to be the tabernacle still of God's presence. So we could actually say the temple was God's house, that God made that house because he made it it was still supposed to be that tabernacle to, to, to um, I'm losing my train of thought, for, for man to know God was there and in interaction with him, okay? So, God could become a man. We already talked about this because in his deity, he made humanity capable 
of being interacting, okay? He didn't make the fish able to interact. He didn't even make the animals to interact. He didn't make the sun, moon, and the stars to interact, even though all these things can praise God also. Still, he made man in that house because the house was a tabernacle to commune with him. So God, from the very beginning, made a house. He made a house because he wanted to commune with man. Now, we see the house in different ways. We see the house, we're saying Adam was a house, and then God breathed into that house, and it became a living soul. We saw it in the tabernacle. God came into the tabernacle, and the Holy of Holies in his presence dwelt there. We saw Moshe on the mountaintop with God dwelling in the clouds, and in those clouds when he came out, he's shining with the presence of our God. Okay. Here's where it gets very interesting, and here's where I, I need to take it. So hold on to that, and you're realizing, and hopefully you're beginning to see, God made a special house to tabernacle with his creation called man. Now, the tabernacle and his first, well, every day of creation have a similar um, development, Okay? I'm losing you. Go ahead. So, the house, I mean, because then they say that our body is the temple of God. Yes. So, is that yes. the same meaning as the house is? Yes. Yes. Okay. And lest I forget, if I don't come back to it, he wants to be the head of our house, not us. He is our head. It is God who we are talking about, who is our head, who leads us into all truth where we can tabernacle with him because it even says that we worship him in spirit and in truth. I got one that's just losing it. I'm so glad she's so blessed and so touched. <laughs> okay, now hold on because here's our seven days of creation and here's our tabernacle being made, okay? Because if you all remember, Moshe didn't say, hmm, I think I'll be an architect today. I'm going to draw this fancy building. I'm going to call the tabernacle, and I'm going to put it into effect. That's not what happened, is it? Where did Moshe get his knowledge of the tabernacle? From heaven. From heaven. Perfect answer. God showed Moshe the tabernacle in heaven. There is a real tabernacle in heaven. That's where we're going to recite. Yes, that's where we are going to recite. And I can't wait to see the perfect one. I mean, I would have been interested in seeing the lesser down here on earth, but wow, since I missed that one, let me go for the best, and I can't wait. But on the very first day of creation, we read in Tehillim in Psalm 104, and verse 2, he who stretches out the heavens like a curtain. Okay? God stretched out the heavens like a curtain. And when our tabernacle was being formed, was being made, patterned after the heavenly, Exodus, Shmote, Exodus chapter 26, verse 7 says, And you shall make curtains of goat's hair for a tent over the tabernacle. Psalm, what? Psalm 104 and verse 2. So when they made the tabernacle, and if you can picture the tabernacle, and Roger may be able to call it up, I didn't think to ask him ahead, when, he made, when the tabernacle was made, we know over the box, shall I call it, that had the holy place and the holy of holies, that there was curtains over it. Okay, we also know there was a curtain between the holy place and the holy of holies place. Okay, so Exodus 26 and verse 7. So, he who stretches out the heavens like a curtain, and you shall make curtains of goats here for a tent over the tabernacle. That's day one. That's just the beginning, because remember, God moved in the firmament in the beginning. Second day of creation. Genesis 1, 6 says, let there be a firmament. Let it divide between the waters and the waters. So, there was a moving that was going on, we know, by the power of the Holy Spirit. But this is our second day of creation, and in Exodus... 
26 and verse 33, in Shemot 26, 33, it says, And the veil shall divide for you between the holy and the holy of holies. So first day we have the curtain made. Second day we have the, the division between the holy place and the holy of holies. Third day of creation, Genesis 1, 9 says, Let the waters under the heavens be gathered together. And the tabernacle for the third day, that's not, no, let's not go there. That, that could be later for something, but no, all I do is a picture of the tabernacle right now. Um, third, because I, if they study that, they're going to ask me something else that comes a little later in our study. <laughs> um, okay, so third day, Genesis 1, 9, the waters are gathered under the heavens. In the tabernacle, Shmot, Exodus chapter 30 and verse 18 says, And you shall make a copper basin and a base of, of copper for washing. So the waters are gathered together, and we have a basin that gathers the water together for washing before they go into the tabernacle building. Okay? Fourth day of creation, Genesis 1.14. <laughs> Slow down. Oh, so you're telling us what, what stages okay. of development all of this means. Hello. <laughs> I love it. I love it. <laughs> it is a lot. It took me going over it and over it. I don't mind repeating for you all, but yes. There's no way that I can keep up with your writing. <laughs> okay. I could I could print you all out this page. It, it's just the scripture references, but it might be enough to help you yes, when please. you know it. Yeah, I, I could do that for you, and I can email. Did hear this and, and believe in it? There was just a big bang, and all of this happened. And how can anyone think the Bible was written by man when it's this complex, has this many layers? And I have news for us. We haven't exhausted it yet. We haven't finished figuring it all out yet. And every time I go a little further, and I'm only in chapter 2, I'm not that far ahead of you all because there's so much depth to it, I stand amazed. I see another layer in creation and another development and another picture of the picture because the whole scripture speaks to us of God, the entire word of God from Genesis 1 to Revelation 22 is all about God. But isn't that just like him? He says he has mysteries that he wants to teach us. Mm -hmm. And how can you give a little toddler yeah. a college, right. um, what do you call it? Degree. Okay, not where I went, but it works. Okay. It works. You have to give them ABCs and plus and minus, and then you get a little more complicated. Subjects. And then you get a little more complicated. Yes. And then you add in more subjects. And then you add in more. And I will tell you, let the geologist talk to you about creation. Huh. Oh. Then let a historian talk to you about creation. Then let the archaeologist who discovers tells you about creation. And every walk of life that man comes from, let them look at the scriptures through their area of expertise. <laughs> Wow. Now, take the Hebrew scholars who can take this and see the depth of meaning in, in the words. How do you put God in a teacup? You can't. You can't. But isn't it fun trying? <laughs> so, okay, back to this now. We've got day one, the curtains of heaven, and we see the curtains over the tabernacle. Day two, we see the firmament dividing the water and the waters, and we see the holy and the holy of the holies separated by that curtain. Day three, we see that the waters are gathered together under the heavens, and we see that there's a copper basin gathering the water together for the purpose of washing. Day four in creation, we have the luminaries created in the heavens, the sun, the moon, the stars, okay? And in the tabernacle on day four, Exodus 25, 31, and by the way, day four is Genesis 1, 14. So Genesis 1, 14 and Exodus or Shemot 25, verse 31 says, And you shall make a menorah of pure gold. The menorah was the candlestick. It was the light of the tabernacle. So when you have the lights of the heavens, now you have the light of the tabernacle for day four. Okay? So we've got 
the, the luminaries in the heaven, and we've got the menorah in the tabernacle. Day 5, Genesis 1.20, let fowl fly above the earth. And in the tabernacle, Shemot, Exodus, chapter 25 and verse 20 says, the cherubim shall spread out their wings upward. And we have the wings of the cherubim over the ark of the covenant, the, the covenant, the, the, um, yeah, the ark of the covenant, okay? So, day five, you've got the birds in the heavens, and you've got the wings over where God's glory is going to dwell. Day six of creation, man was created. He was created to inhabit the earth. Yeah, there you go. There's your wings. Thank you, Roger. He's catching up. I, I never thought to have him bring up pictures, but hopefully you've got it in your mind. We studied the tabernacle in depth recently. Hopefully it's coming back. Anyways, day six, man was created to inhabit and to cultivate the earth. God's going to tell man, take care of the earth. In Shemot, in Exodus chapter 28 and verse 1, God says, bring near Aharon, your brother, to perform the service in the sanctuary. So day six, man is created for the purpose of working and in the earth. And they, in, in the comparison with the tabernacle, Aaron is brought in to do service in the sanctuary, perform duties in the sanctuary. Day seven of creation, Genesis 2, 1 to 3. We're not there yet. But believe it or not, we'll get there. Seventh day of creation, the heaven and the earth were completed. And God completed his work, God blessed, and God sanctified his work. All that on day seven. He didn't create anything on day seven. We'll get there, but I think you all know that. So day seven, Genesis 2, 1 to 3, the heaven and earth were completed. God completed his work. God blessed his work. God sanctified his work. Exodus. Chapter 39, verses 32 to 43. I'm sorry, what was it? Right Exodus 39, well, I'll be giving you a copy. But Exodus 39, verses 32 to 43, and number 7 and verse 1. We read in those two locations in Scripture, first we read, Thus was completed all the work of the tabernacle, and Moshe blessed them. And then we read, and it came to pass on that day that Moshe completed the tabernacle and sanctified it. So the tabernacle was completed, blessed, and sanctified. The creation that God made, God created, completed, blessed, and sanctified. In creation, we see the elements of the tabernacle brought to us. At the same time, the tabernacle is the house. The house that God wants to be the head of. Here's God wanting to be the head of the house in all truth, communicating with his creation called man. God created to tabernacle with man. <laughs> Yeah, I'll give me an adult word and I'll use it. <laughs> but I think, I think our, our little ones sum it up. Is that not fascinating? I love it. I hope you do. Now, I find it very interesting. Yochanan John describes creation. John 1.1. 1, 1. In the beginning, God, in the beginning was the word. The word was with God and the word was God. Okay, then just go with me real fast. We're just going to pick out, out a couple verses here. We're not going to do the whole chapter. I love the chapter, but we won't do the whole chapter. We'll have to stay at Book of John to do the whole chapter. <laughs> in the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God, and the Word was God. And then it tells us in verse 3, all things came into being through Him. Apart from Him, nothing was made. Verse 4 talks about the light. Uh, verse 5, the light shines in the darkness. The darkness didn't comprehend it, okay? We're getting creation from John's viewpoint, not the detail of Genesis, but we've got it. This is God bringing light and life to man. And that's what we see. The, the next verse, there came a man sent from God whose name was John, who is to be a witness of the light. But notice, it only takes John 14 verses. He writes over 20 chapters. I forget how many are in John. But it only takes him 14 verses. 
by the 14th verse. You know what he said? And I want to read it for you because I want you to know it from the Hebrew. And the word became flesh. Now we know the word is, is the Lord he himself. The word became flesh. And in the Hebrew, the next phrase says, and tabernacled among us. Your English says dwelt. That's a good understanding because that's tabernacling is dwelling together. But here is John taking us from creation to tabernacling with man. And it only took him 14 verses. It's taken me how many verses and how many days and how many classes to try to contain this thought for us. So what we really have is that the original house that God built, this tent that we call man, God built it to communicate, to dwell, to tabernacle with. And when you go into the tabernacle, the idea is nesting, that God nested with his people. I picture mama bird. Let's go mama and papa bird, okay, because God's in both. I picture on the nest, wings over the little ones, protecting, feeding, sheltering, and loving. That's what God created you for. Isn't that beautiful? He loves you so much that he made you a special tent. He made you a special tabernacle so he could tabernacle with you. That gives you purpose, that gives you value, that gives you meaning to life, that takes away all the questions and all that you're worthless and all the lies that Satan has tried to feed you through people in your lives to this day. Throw it out and realize you are God's crowning glory. You ever seen a new mama and papa holding up that little baby like a commercial says and I'm not big on commercials but like a commercial says once you've had a child it's like your heart lives outside of you for the rest of your life <laughs> I think that's a very good way to put it that they look at that baby and they marvel at it and they, they, they count the fingers and the toes and they think it's the most beautiful baby in the whole world and then they turn 18 oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> but 18 stands for life so we're not even going to go there but I picture God I picture God, yes, doing it with Adam, but I want you to picture God doing it with you. And he's made this creation, and he's holding it up, and he's looking at it. And he's looking at all the different details because, Dora, you don't look like me, <laughs> and I don't look like Julie. And Dozy, you got to look all to your own. And God's counting your fingers and your toes, and he looks at your nose, and he says, I know how many hairs you get on your head. You might have been born with zero, and you might have been born with a thousand. And you have a different number today than you had yesterday. <laughs> Guess what? I can tell you how many you had yesterday, and I'll tell you how many you'll have tomorrow. You are my most prized creation. I love you. And I want a relationship with you. I want to interact with you. Do you see why he didn't make us robotic? Do you see why he didn't stamp us out so we looked like the other one? How boring is that? God made you. He tempted you. He tabernacled you. And then he says, let me dwell. Let me interact with you. Let me commune with you. Let me talk with you. Let me be your head. Let me lead you into all truth. Let me bless you because God blessed it. He saw it was good and he blessed it. And when he got done with all of his creation, that's what he finally did. Remember, he didn't say it on all the different animals. But when he finished with man, that comes back. And God saw that it was good, and God blessed it. Oh, hallelujah, we are blessed. We are loved, and I want a tabernacle with my God. All the more. And, can't wait, I'm losing my...
can't wait. Tell that tabernacle that Dora pointed out that's in the heavens, that we're in that tabernacle, in the very Shekhinah glory of our God forever. 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 When does forever end? Never. <laughs> Never. <laughs> no sin, no dark, no death, no cancer, no COVID, no pain, no sorrow, nope. no grief, nothing. Gone. Forever. Hallelujah. That's what God made you for. The stupid sin that got in the way and ruined God's plan that we have to have this intermittent time. Hey, but hallelujah that he, as creator God, saw before he created and made man inhabitable so that man could come to him. You see, we couldn't go to live in God's house, so God made us a house he could come live in. That's our God. That's our ineffable, indescribable, overwhelmingly lovable and loving God. And we have... Amen. <laughs> and I think my Zoom room is joining us. <laughs> and we have just begun. We're not even out of the first chapter of his love story to us. That's our God. Did I tell you I had some aha moments for this class? <laughs> uh, I hope you're as blessed. I hope you are as blessed. And God said about the tabernacle, let me just say, let me finish it off because I don't want to leave out any notes, even though I think I've hit our crescendo. In Exodus 25, 8, he said, they are to make me a sanctuary so that I may live among them. That was his whole intent. The word for tabernacle in Hebrew is mishkan. Mishkan, the root of mishkan means to dwell. We also get the word shekhana, shekhina, out of the root shekhan, and that's God's glory. So it's to dwell in God's glory. It's God's glory having a place to dwell, our eternal place, not made with hands, in his house. We can't go there without his fixing us, <laughs> which he does. But he chose, in the meantime, to come to our house. And guess what? You didn't even have to clean up house first. <laughs> he just came in. I did a whole message one time on the what a gift, timeless, from creation to eternity. And I took the tabernacle. The tabernacle of creation to the tabernacle of eternity. Oh, my God. Are you loved? Are you cared for? Are you valued? Are you worth something? Yes. God looked at you after he made you and he saw you and he said, it's good. And he blessed you. Hallelujah. Thank him. Praise him. And we will move on. <laughs> How do you come off of that? Do we have to? <laughs> <laughs> we just marinate a while. <laughs> you want to marinate a while? I like that. Let's just soak in it. Yeah. Let's just bask in the shahina glory because I well, think that's what we're doing. Well, put it that way, it's too bad that 99% of the people don't understand that. Is that not sad? If you didn't hear Dora, that, that she said 99% of the people. I don't know the actual percentage, but that do not know this. Do not have this. And they are why the world is full of hurt. And they are why this dog eat dog. And they are why they try to pull someone else down to make themselves feel good. Because they do not know the intrinsic value of the soul. That God has breathed into them. And made them. And loves them. And... The, wow. 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 And even the angels don't get this. We get something uniquely special between God and man. No, they don't have... They, yeah, they're not human. They don't have the redemption story. When they sinned, their consequences fall on them to this day. But we have that 
the forgiveness level that they do not have. That's that's love. That's amazing. That's wow. This is my God. This is who we are created in his image. And when we're acting like that, wow, our lives are going to be different, are they not? Oh, forgive me, my nose wants to run because my eyes got all teary. Okay, back on, where are we? I have done all this. Did I do all of this? I gave you all of that. I gave you about the rest of the world. I think we are down to our next phrase. So, all the way back to Genesis, everybody. Don't you love the beginning? <laughs> the beginning. We're just beginning. That's it. That's it. it I'm reminded of a nurse. You, know, you, you nurses may appreciate, especially those of you who've been in obstetrics who deal with the birth of children. And I guess this one new mom had been kind of a nasty little patient. And you know, she's in the throes of the pain from giving childbirth, you know, and, and she's letting it out on the nurses and all of that. The nurse finally hands her her newborn. And, you know, the, the woman makes some sort of comment about, she's so glad her labor's over. And the nurse looks at her and says, oh, honey, it's only just begun. <laughs> <laughs> That's not quite nice, but anyway, God labors with us, and he does it out of love, and he is an amazing God, and all of this packed into verse 26, let us make man in our image. There's the make, that's the asa, that's where asa is, verse 26. According to our likeness, we've talked about that, <clears throat> now, I notice the next, and let them Okay, do you catch them? We've got a plural here. He doesn't say, and let Adam. He doesn't say, and let Eve. He doesn't call me even Adam and Eve at this point. But he says, let them rule. Okay, at this point, he's only created Adam. But what he's showing us is Eve was his plan from the beginning. And he didn't make Eve less than he made Adam. He made them to rule over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the sky and over the cattle and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. That is the plural pronoun. God made mankind. God made male and female. He made them both. Planned from the beginning to jointly share in the dominion of the earth. God also intended them to procreate. We'll see that. It, again, was not a result of sin. So you can't look at your children and say, you're a result of sin. <laughs> because they're not. God had planned procreation all along. But he also planned for women to have that role of dominion right along with man. And I stress that because our world is the world that wants to dominate and wants to say, this is better than this, this rules over that. We have the words like subjection come into play. Notice I did not say submission. Subjection, there is a difference. But man under and in obedience to God, to God alone, will have sovereignty over the earth. He would have sovereignty over all the created things. Everything God created up to man, God was giving man dominion over it all. The swarmer swarming in the sea, the creepy things creeping on the crown, crown, ground, where are they? <laughs> on the ground, and the birds flying in the air. Man was to have dominion over all of this. He was to be sovereign. So what happened? Sin stole that from man. Mankind lost it due to sin, but it will be restored through man. In this case, the son of man, the second Adam. I'm talking about the Messiah. And when will we see that? We will see that on earth during the millennial reign of Messiah, when everything will be in subjected order the way that it should have been if Adam and Eve had never sinned. And it will carry on throughout all of eternity. Because if you haven't been with me and you haven't studied the millennium, when the millennium ends, humankind continues on. Humankind keeps reproducing. But now you have it the way God had intended it without sin ruining it. Go with me real quickly to see my points. Hebrews chapter 2. 
verses 5 through 8. Hebrews 2, verses 5 through 8. And then we're going to back up to one verse in chapter 1. But Hebrews 2, verse 5 says, For he did not subject to angels the world to come. He didn't say the future, what's coming, the angels are going to be in control of concerning what we're speaking. But one has testified somewhere saying, and this was this one who testified it somewhere, just happens to be Melch David, King David, who just happened to write it in a psalm. It's uh, Tehillim Psalm number 8, if I remember correctly. What is man that you remember him? Or the son of man that you're concerned about him? You made him, the son of man, a little lower, the, a little while lower than the angels. You have crowned him, the son of man, with glory and honor, and have appointed him, the son of man, over the works of your hands, over creation. You have put all things in subjection under his feet, under the Son of Man. What the first Adam lost, the second Adam gains back for us. What the first Adam, when he gave up his sovereignty, the second, the Son of Man, very God himself, because of his perfection, wins it back. And he gains dominion over the earth as man should have had. Because he is the Redeemer who redeems even the earth from the sin that has it stuck right now. Go back to chapter 1, verse 13, and we read there. But to which of the angels has he, God, ever said, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet? God never said that to the angels, but he said that to the Son of Man who had been high and lifted up. He had been brought down a little lower than the angels when he took on human form, confined himself to a body, a place in, in gravity that the angels are not stuck in gravity. They have the freedom to come and go in a way that, that the human does not. God made um, his son, son of man, Adam, second Adam, made him a little lower than the angels for a little while. We see him in that human form die bury, but then we see victory comes in the morning. He resurrects from the dead. He ascends into heaven. He is at the right hand of the Father sitting, and that's on a throne built for two. That's on that beautiful love seat. He is sitting equal with God his Father waiting for his enemies to be made his footstool. When does that happen? When the battle of Armageddon is, is almost ready to, to culminate, the world is almost ready to destroy itself, there will almost be no humankind left, and God says at that point, enough is enough, sends back the son who with a, the sword out of his mouth, the word of God out of his mouth, annihilates the, the evil antichrist indwelt by the evil Satan and puts a stop to the battle, and the victory is his. The kingdom of heaven now is the kingdom on earth. His will being done in heaven, so it will be done on earth. And we'll see that for a thousand years with Satan bound, a thousand years of peace, a thousand years of this earth to have prosperity that it should have had all along, a thousand years to get a taste of what the Garden of Eden must have been like. And yet, even at that time, so Tom will still go when he's loose, and he will go gather the hearts that were never one with the Lord. They just acted along so that they wouldn't be cut down, and they get a chance to show their heart, and they come up against their God. We see them come up in the, in the, on the circumference of the earth to do battle with God who says, Done. Over. No more repeat. No more years. Over. And he, he throws Satan into the lake of fire forever, the great white throne judgment, where those who followed him are thrown into the lake of fire forever. And we move into that new eternity, the new heavens, the new earth, and we go on with a world that will continue on. It's reformed. God says, new heavens, new earth. And now we see it inhabited with a human who will no longer be touched by sin. Sin will never enter in. A lie will never enter in. I love that God reinforces that. Doesn't give you a chance to think, 
Could history repeat itself? Wouldn't that be horrible? Wouldn't you hate to go back to the beginning and have to go through 6,000 years again? I could fault. No, thank you. I want that eternity that is glorious forever. And that's what we've been promised. But here we have the dominion that was to be given to both male and female. We do not see one being greater than and the other being lesser than. And I will say, like I've heard several good pastors before me say it, the male is absolutely superb and best at being male. And the female is absolutely superb and best at being female. That's the way God made it. That should settle it. And that should settle this sick world that wants to say, oh, you don't have to be what you were born. If you want to be something else, you can be. Well, you can be something else, all right, but you're still what God made you. <laughs> no matter what you call it. A duck, if it quacks and it walks and it ducks like a duck, it's a duck. <laughs> so no matter what you do, no matter what kind of outward changes, God made you. And that is what you are. And if you know this God that we just saw through creation that loves each individual created being to such a degree, you won't have a problem with whether you're male or female. You're going to feel loved. You're going to feel blessed. You're going to feel full. And you're going to live up to the capacity, hopefully, of what he created you for. Because he created you for good works, which would glorify our Father mm -hmm. in heaven. So... In verse 27, we have, I think I've done all of verse 26, yes, okay, we have the, the man was to have dominion over everything, verse 27, God created man in his own image. This is word created here in verse 27 now is bara, the original creation. He did not create others with him breathing into them and then becoming a living being. This was for man and man alone. Man is part of God's image. God made man physically out of the dust of the earth, out of the chemicals out of the earth. That's why we need chemicals in our body and all of that. But he created him spiritually. He created him morally in his likeness. And there is our difference. Once again, no evolutionary process. And Yeshua gave his attestation of creation also. We know it from Bereshit. We know it from God saying it. Let's see Yeshua say it. Go with me quickly to Matthew 19 and verse 4. Matthew 19 and verse 4. Mattathiah was a good Jewish boy. I think y'all know that by now. He's writing to a Jewish audience. Verse 4, chapter 19, And he, Yeshua Jesus speaking, answering the Pharisees, he answered and said, Have you not read that he who created them from the beginning made them male and female? Okay? One didn't evolve. One didn't become something. It didn't just... You know, first, I mean, how does evolution ever get to that point anyway? How do they get a male and a female, get them to come together and split and, and reproduce the same thing? It doesn't fit in the evolutionary process. And here the Lord says, right from the get-go, right from the beginning, God created them. He created a male. He created them female. And we know he created them to cohabit. We know that, that they were created equal. We've just read that. Go with me to Mark chapter 10. Mark chapter 10, Mark known for his conciseness. In verse 6 of his um, telling the story, he says, but from the beginning of creation. That's where we're sitting right now. We're at the beginning of creation. We haven't gotten into everything yet. We're just right there at the beginning. From the beginning of creation, God made them male and female. And then Mark's going to go on and he's going to tell you why. The reason for the man to leave his father and mother and the two become one flesh and we know through the male and the female coming together we have the reproductive process that God put into order. You cannot get that with two men and you cannot get that with two women and there are no such thing as two its but even if there were you wouldn't get an it Gee, from an yeah. it. Ten six. Mark 10, 6. And that's, these verses are on your cross-references. I'm not sure the tabernacle ones were, and that's why I gave them to you and why I'll make a copy of that page. Okay, back in Genesis 1, 
verse 27, we have now, we're, we're actually moving a little bit along. God created man. He created, the Hebrew says Adam. And Adam comes from the word Adama, A-D-A-M-A-H. Okay, that's the Hebrew word. And in Hebrew, that means earth. Here, I'll put it up here. Okay, so God created Adam. We call him Adam. Adam is a little more of the Hebrew pronunciation. And Adam, ah, means earth. And what God is saying is he created man from the earth, from the elements of the earth. We're going to see later that we get the idea even of the word red it comes from this. Um, but that will come up, I guess, a little later. That must be in my chapter 2. Man's body, though, was formed from the elements of the earth. That's why God created Adama. He created from the earth, made man. That's what we're seeing from our Hebrew. And we'll look more at that in chapter 2 and verse 7 when we look at how God formed him and then out of the dust of the earth and then breathed into him. But this, again, is why... The same elements, they get the minerals in the earth. We find the minerals in our bodies. Um, it's why we need to replenish ourselves from the earth. But in this case, what we have when we say God made man, is that how, yeah, God created man. That's a generic term. God created mankind is what we're saying. Yes, Rhonda. Right. right. And then we say in 127 that he created, which is created from nothing but rock. And that's when he put the breath into man. Oh, that's the spirit. That's the spirit. Oh. That's the spirit, yeah. So we've got really God created the body and God created the spirit. He just happened to put the two together. <laughs> But yes, so the created bara is the spirit breathing in, and the asa is the, the form we see on the outside, the, that dust to dust goes back to the dust when we die, you know, becomes ash, however I should put that, okay? Now, we've seen the plurality. We've seen let us make man in our image. We saw let them, male and female, rule over everything that God created. Then he goes back and he's telling us he created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. Okay, now, so before we get to the end of that sentence, let me stop with we've got God. We've looked at created. We looked at man in his own image. Notice how we went back to a singular pronoun. He didn't say in their image. He said in his own image. Once again, we have that triunity that's echad, that one. The same way that we saw that in the beginning gods created, and gods was plural, but the created word was singular, was a single action as if one were doing it. Now we have the same thing here. Let us... God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, make man in our image. But then it says, specifically, he created man in his own image. Because even though we see the personification in the three, we're brought back to the fact that he's one God. That we're not made in the image of three gods, we're made in the image of one. Okay, again, very hard for us to understand, but it's showing us the triunity of our God. We know that he shows to us in the sheen, the letter that looks like that W with one base. We know that when he took the word for single in our Hebrew, there's two words. One is a chad, one is yachid. Yachid is, is a single Okay, it's not a cup, but it's a bottle. I've got a yachid bottle. I've got one bottle here, okay? That's yachid. When Avram was told to take his only son, his yachid son, Isaac, up to offer him, okay? But when God refers to himself, he always refers to himself with the, the Hebrew word for, for one that is one that can be divided. It's one thing, like an egg, it's one thing, 
but it can be divided. Now, where it all falls apart is the egg doesn't have three equal parts. The shell isn't equal to the white, isn't equal to the yolk, but the egg makes up, three parts make up one egg. In our picture for our triunity, for our God, he is equal in all parts, but it's like the three parts all forming one God. So he always refers to himself in that way. That's why when he's referring to himself here, it's let us make man in our image, but then he shows us he is yet one. He is singular in that sense. He is one. Um, when two get married, they become echad. They become one. Now, if they decide that they're only one, yachid, and they want to get on a train and go visit, go on a journey, and they get on the train and they put one, one ticket down and they say, we're one. So this ticket's for both of us. <laughs> the conductor's going to look at them and say, oh, no, you're not. You, you sit in two seats, you pay two fares. <laughs> but they're considered one flesh. That's God. He's considered one flesh, but we see him. And again, it falls short because we really are two people in marriage, and God really is only one God. Okay? I'm sorry, Yahid and... And uh, Echad. Um, and if you weren't here before when I spelled it out, well, here, we'll do it here. I did go through it, I just didn't remember. Okay, and, but for anyone else, you know, that's hearing it, there's Yahid and Echad, if you want to look them up more in the Hebrew meanings later. This is singular, and this is united. We see it in nature, in um, sky, earth and water, we see it, you know, in all kinds of ways we see Trinity shown around us. Sorry, I write it and then I stand in the way. <laughs> okay, it is interesting also that three times created is stated. Almost a hint that God's saying, I'm a triunity. I created body, I created soul, I created spirit, but three times we have it. And we know that we are body, soul, and spirit according to 1 Thessalonians 5.23 for any who need that um, given to them, you know, it tells us that we're body, soul, and spirit. Um, in this now also, okay, we have created in his image, in the image of God, he created him male and female. Now, we're going to get the details in chapter 2. Right now, we don't have any details. Right now, we don't know that Eve's going to be created out of Adam's sight. We don't know that Eve's going to be later, not at the same moment that God created Adam. Right now, we're just told about the two. We're told that they're both created in God's image. We're told that they are equally an eternal spirit, capable of personal fellowship with their creator. The separation comes later, but what I'm trying to say is they're looked at as one. They're looked at as co-equal. They're looked at as co-valued. They're looked at, I mean, I can give you the joke. God made Adam, took one look at him and said, well, I can do better than that, made Eve. <laughs> I can also give you the flip side that says, you know, that, that one got in trouble and that's why God had to have the other because, you know. I can flip it both ways. All I can tell you also, though, is God didn't make... Now, how does that one go? He didn't make Adam and Steve. He made yeah. Adam and Eve, okay? <laughs> he made them both, again, male to be superior being male, female being superior being female. I think it was Adrian Rogers who said, you know, you can have genes material. Genes material are superior at being genes. They're tough. They're rugged. That's your man. Take a piece of silk. Silk is soft, and it's got a greater value. It, it's beautiful, and it's used for making other things. It's not used for making the work pants for a man. It's the female. And in his segment, he was valuing the female even more than the male because he said, look what you pay for jeans, and look what you pay for silk. <laughs> but again, God made them different, made them with different qualities, but made them equal, made them both of value. Being the best at what they're to be is what they should be doing and feeling the equality of that. He didn't make an oops and then make the other, and he didn't change his mind or anything else. So, we have both created from the beginning in, man, in God's 
mind already done, even though we'll learn about it in chapter two. Questions? I was listening to uh, John Bevere has a, a study thing on the Holy Spirit, and he was suggesting that not that the Holy Spirit is a female, but the Holy Spirit might have more female-ish qualities, and so separating man and woman out might be showing uh, different qualities in each. I've heard others try to say very similar things, and in any way that you can understand it, that that works for you, I'm fine with. I do see in the attributes of our God and in, in chapter 13 of Shemot of Exodus verses 6 and 7 you have the 13 attributes of God that are tantamount in Judaism and they are compassion and mercy and grace and things like that. Um, I see what's considered female, what's considered male and the characteristics, the attributes of our God. Whether you want to say one's more spirit, one's more, more God the Father, that's okay if that you know if they see it that way to me it's just all again it's the same way that i look at revelation one and i say oh okay this is a description of the father oh okay this is a description of the son okay which one is it uh-huh <laughs> that's the way i see it too so but if they see it more through the spirit or something that's okay i have no argument you know that the idea is that god does have the female attributes as well as the male attributes within him. And it does not make him wussy or no, 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 no. anything else. That's just, that's the perfect, I can't say creation because he wasn't created. Yeah. That's the perfect period. I'll just put a period there, okay? And again, how do we bring God down? Yeah. This is a great place to stop, to wind it up. We can keep our comments going. We are just a little past, but we're within that little bit of grace. What I'm going to bring to you when we come back with verse 28, God blessing them, but we're going to see that God is going to bring them into what I call, and not me personally, but the word that I use is a dispensation. A dispensation is a period of time when man is given specific revelation on how he's to live according to God, what God expects of him. In that time period, man's going to be tested in respect to his obedience to God and God's revealed will to him. What God has told him he wants of him, he's going to be tested to see if he's going to act in obedience in that way to God. We're going to see man fails, we're going to see he's judged, and we're going to see a new dispensation begins. For those who have heard this word before, um, and it is used in one place in Scripture, but even even if not, Trinity is not used in Scripture yet. We believe in Trinity, so you know we have the understanding. But we're going to see, as we look at Scripture, there are seven different dispensations, seven different time periods, not seven different ways to be saved, not seven different attempts or times or anything like that. Salvation from beginning to end is always and only through the atoning work of Yeshua Jesus. Whether they were looking forward to that or whether they were looking back at it, that's one way of salvation. But we'll see God deal with man in a different way seven different times as we look at Scripture. And we're seeing the very first one here in verse 28. Because you have to go all the way through Scripture to the book of Revelation to see all seven, I will give them to you in a nutshell. I have taught this where it takes a couple classes to teach it fully. We got a great chart. I'll unroll the chart with Roger's help next week. I had him bring it this week thinking we were going to get there. But those of you who have heard it, hopefully you won't mind a quick review. You won't get the whole depth. But again, it is very interesting. It answers a lot of questions. It shows us how the whole Bible relates and how God relates with man throughout the entire time because God does deal with man in a different way. He dealt with Adam and Eve differently than he deals with us today. He dealt with Moshe in a different way than he dealt with Avraham. Now, does that mean God's flipping and we don't know what God what to expect and what he expects of us and how we're to be and what do we do and which parts are for us and which parts are... All of that is put to rest when you just see in the orderliness of God's plan of the ages. And you see that God had a merciful way of dealing with man to show man no matter what, you cannot get to my level. You need 
my son's atoning work. And he'll show that so that one day someone can't stand before him and say, well, if you had only made it for me by conscience, if you'd only made it for me by law, if you'd only made it for me by grace or by promise, these are names and I'll give you the meaning of these names and all that, but every category man can come up with, one of those seven it will fit under so that Man stands before God at that great white throne judgment at the end of time of humankind and has no excuse. Anybody who has the audacity to say, well, if God had put me in the Garden of Eden, I wouldn't have sinned. Then I have the audacity to ask you, then why didn't God do it? Okay. We're done um, we'll pick up with those seven dispensations, the explanation. We'll look at the first one that we're in, in verse one, verse 28 of chapter 1. And we will be on our way to God blessing them and what he expects of them. Do I have, oh, okay, do I have comments, questions? Do I have uh, anything before we close in prayer? Do you want me to close in prayer fast and then we can open it up? I'm seeing no hands. I lost a lot of faces. They're still there, I think, but they went black. I see a few faces and 